I'm meteorologist Zoe Mintz, and did you know that meteorologists forecast the weather using a bunch of different physics and math equations? The one I'm pulling up next to me is one of the big ones, known as the quasi-geostrophic omega equation, and it looks really scary, it looks like a lot, but it all really just boils down to Newton's second law of motion, which is basically the fact that if you push something, it moves, and if you push something harder, it moves farther. We use these equations to create what's known as numerical weather models to predict what's going to happen in the atmosphere. And we normally just say models on air, I'm sure you've heard us say it, but you might be wondering, what exactly is a model? I'm gonna try to break it down for you all in the simplest way possible over the next few minutes because it definitely doesn't look simple at all. But first, a quick history lesson. Back in the early 1900s, this guy right here, Lewis Fry Richardson, is credited with creating the first numerical weather models using only those physics and math equations to predict the weather for six hours in the future. This is one of those early models, but the caveat was it took him about six weeks to complete all of those calculations by hand, so it wasn't extremely useful. But fast forward to today, we have supercomputers, and these can do the calculations in a matter of microseconds. These are where our modern weather models come from. And you might be wondering, how exactly do they work? First and foremost, you have to think of the Earth as a grid. Models take these hundreds of thousands of equations that I showed you and input all of the different parts of the atmosphere, like heat, moisture, wind, just to name a few, there is a lot more for one section of the grid. And then the process is repeated on millions of grid points, both horizontally and vertically in the atmosphere. The models then take these millions of calculations and combine it with physical data from weather balloons, satellite, radar, everything that comes from the National Weather Service. And it's the combination of the millions of equations with the physical data of what's currently going on in the atmosphere gets put into the supercomputers and that's what's ultimately creating our weather models. Now, diving a little bit deeper, not only have you heard us use the word model, but you might've heard us mention the American versus the European weather model. One is run by the US and the other one is run by nations in Europe, but other than that, what is the biggest difference? Well, remember when I said you have to think about the Earth as a grid? The smaller the grid box, the higher the resolution. Just like a phone with more pixels creates a picture with better clarity, higher resolution in a model can show more detail with weather processes that may have been missed or poorly sampled. So as you can see here, a lot smaller grid boxes show a lot more detail, it shows where the mountainous terrain is compared to the grid boxes that are a lot larger. This is another example when it comes to temperature all across Alaska. Smaller grid boxes show you a lot more detail. The larger grid boxes show you a rough outline of what's going on, but it doesn't exactly show you what's happening. So the European model uses smaller grid boxes and it therefore has a higher resolution. Here's an example. This was a storm that impacted us in California earlier this year, and you can see the European model, definitely a lot more detailed than the American model. The American model is what I would like to consider blobby. So yes, it shows you a rough outline of where the best chance for snow and rain is, but it doesn't show you in detail the peaks of the mountains or that exact detail of the snow versus rain boundary, which is really important for us meteorologists when it comes to forecasting the weather. So normally, the European model is regarded as more accurate because it has a higher quality and it is more detailed. But that doesn't mean the GFS isn't useful. It's still extremely useful. And it can pick up on phenomenon that sometimes the European model cannot, like Hurricane Dorian. This was back in 2019, where four days in advance, the GFS, the American model, it picked up on signs of a hurricane forming, while the European model, as you can see, it had literally nothing. So yes, normally the European model is more accurate, but the GFS is still extremely important and extremely useful when it comes to forecasting the weather. And it's not just those two big models that we use, the Euro and the GFS, there are so many other ones to look at as well. This is the national blend of models, which basically combines all of the models into one. That's a great one we look at. Another one is the HRRR, which is a short range, for short range forecast. There's long range forecast that we look at as well. So there's so many different models that we use to forecast the weather. And if you're into statistics, you might have heard the phrase, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that's exactly the case in meteorology as well. Models do not represent the true atmosphere. It's up to us meteorologists to identify when, 
where, and which models to use in specific situations to help us most accurately forecast the weather.